Psalm 147, 1 says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Amen? Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as you're turning there, I want to introduce today's passage, uh, especially to our guests. We're walking through the book of 2 Timothy, the second letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy while he was the pastor at Ephesus. And in this church, they were experiencing a lot of false teaching. Uh, Paul actually prophesied that they were going to experience a lot of false teaching uh, in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30, in speaking to the Christians in Ephesus prior to Timothy becoming the pastor there. And he said in these words in Acts 20, 28 through 30, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. I've titled today's message, Fortify the Walls. And I don't want you to get confused by the title of this message to think that we are supposed to fortify the walls of the church so that people cannot get in. No, we're here to reach people, amen? Our doors are welcoming to all people to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching of His Word. But what we do need to fortify our walls against is false teaching. The church today needs to fortify its walls against false teaching. And so what we hear in the passage that we're about to read, verses 14 through 19, is exactly what the Apostle Paul has prophesied about has happened. There have been false teachers who have crept into church at Ephesus and have led many astray in believing doctrines that are not supported by the Holy Scriptures. They are believing in doctrines that are built up by men, not by God. And so Timothy, or Paul is writing to Timothy to tell him how to fix the problem. So do you think that's appropriate for the church today? To tell them how to fix the problem. The church today, if you, you don't have to look very far to find that the church is at the bottom of this culture war for truth. We're losing the battle. Now I'm not speaking about the church because the church will prevail. Not even the gates of Hades can prevail against Christ's church. But as far as reaching people and being a light in a dark world, we are losing the culture war on this battle for what is truth. And so it's very appropriate for us to read this passage as though the Apostle Paul were writing it directly to us and says, New Providence, you need to recognize that there are false teachers all around you and you need to fortify your walls and make sure that what you are teaching and what you are believing is coming straight from the Word of God. Amen? So we find great application in the text today. And if you're able to, I want to invite you to stand as we honor the reading of our key passage this morning. Verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hamanias and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Father, as we look at these instructions from Your Holy Word, may we receive much application on how to fortify our walls against false teaching. 
to not give in to the pressures of our culture and the acceptance that many churches are giving into. But to make sure, as, you, as Paul was encouraging Timothy, make sure that we are rooted and grounded in your holy word alone. We ask you to minister to us and fortify our walls through the teaching of your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And while you're having a seat, I want to share a thought that has been permeating my mind this week in my own quiet time, in my prayer, in my study for today's sermon. And it's the thought that kept coming up over and over again. Some of it is because of what I was studying and the sermon that I was called to preach today with the text that is before us. But then other things that are happening around our culture and in other churches and across our land and even across our world, it became very apparent to me and it echoed and resonated over and over and over again that I don't pastor a church that people are going to flock to in the end times. I pastor a church that stands on the truth of God's Word. And the churches that are going to grow the most in the end times are going to be the ones who have uh, compromised on God's Word and are now desiring to tickle man's ears. That is what the prophecy says in in the New Testament. And so with that, my prayer this week has been, Lord, keep myself and the believers at New Providence encouraged that all we need is the truth of God's Word to have what it takes to stand, no matter how strong or tough the opposition becomes. Do you believe that, church? All we need is the truth of God's Word. We cannot compromise on the truth of God's Word. It is timeless. It is not adaptable. You don't change it to fit the context of today. It surpasses time and is just as relevant today as it was the day that it was written. So here's what I want you to hear in the text that we have read in verses 14 through 19 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy, false teaching has crept in. in. Here's how you fix it. Here's how you fortify the walls in Ephesus. Here's how you fortify the walls at New Providence to keep this false teaching out. Now, what I want to do today uh, is not what we traditionally do. Traditionally, I'm a a good Baptist preacher where I have three points, and they all start with the same letter, but I'm going to commit an abomination today. We have no sermon points today. So y'all going to be okay? Uh, What we're going to do is we're just going to go one verse at a time through the text, and we need to draw out exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying to us. Because this is the instruction to fortify your walls against false teaching. Let's begin with verse 14. The beginning of verse 14 says, Remind them of these things. Now, whenever you have pronouns in the text, you need to ask some questions to make sure you know who those pronouns are referring to, right? Because we could easily lose the thrust of the passage or change the meaning of the passage if we make a false substitution. We're speaking of a a false substitution. Billy slipped out because he was in the the early service. Uh, I told him after the the first service that I've been listening to sermons before where I wanted to throw a penalty flag, right? Uh, Illegal formation of your sermon, right? So, so uh, it was funny to me when he, I didn't know they were going to do that at 8.30, so his whistle blowing that happened right beside my left ear startled me uh, with me not knowing the plan, uh, but I enjoyed the, the penalty flag and the, and the concept there that they drove home. So we asked two questions, remind them of these things. Question number one, remind who? Question number two, of what? Okay, so them is told to us by the context, the church. Remind the church. So specifically to verse number 14, remind the Christians who attend your church in Ephesus. All right, now we can apply that to remind the members of your church at New Providence. Remind them of what? There is no limitation on that pronoun, and so you have to revert all the way back to the series of thought that it follows, and you can make it all the way back to verse 1 without there being a break in the text. 
So what does Timothy need to remind his church members of? Go all the way back to verse 1. He needs to remind them that their strength comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He needs to remind them that they need to serve faithfully and teach others to teach and be in the discipleship process. Remind them to fight like a soldier and please the one who enlisted them. Verse 5, remind them to compete as an athlete according to the rules. Verse, verse 7, remind them to, to strive and to, or verse 6, to strive and to persevere as a hardworking farmer all the way to harvest season. You will reap in due time if you do not lose heart. Verse 7, remind them to consider all that you have taught them from the Scriptures. Verse 8, remind them who Jesus is and that He is alive. Amen? Verse 9, remind them that the Word of God cannot be chained regardless of what they do to you. Verse 10, remind them of the purpose of their work, that it's to carry the gospel to those who have not heard it. Uh, so that God can do the saving. Verse 11 through 13, remind them that God is faithful. He is faithful to those who believe. He is also faithful to those who do not believe to enact judgment when that is necessary. Remind them of these things. But then following right after that statement in verse 14, we have a solemn charge. In today's language, you would hear it say, listen, uh, I swear before God that you need to, and then fill in the blanks. So a truth that follows a solemn charge is typically a, a very important truth that needs to be followed. So we have this solemn charge at the beginning of verse 14 that says, charge them before the Lord. So the expectation is Paul is about to drop a major command on Timothy that he needs to make sure. Timothy, if, if, they get, if they don't get anything else, make sure they get this. Charge them before the Lord. And then what does he say? Don't argue about words. Don't argue about semantics. We say, what? Really? That, that's the solemn charge? Do not strive about words to no profit? And so we need to look what's really built into this charge to understand the devastating effects of disobeying it. Do not strive about words to no profit. The literal language here from the Greek is do not wage a war of words. Why is that so detrimental? Let me tell you a, a typical route that false teachers will take. A typical route that false teachers will take. They will distract their listeners from the meaning of the text by getting them into a debate about what the words mean in the text. So if they're able to distract your mind onto, well, that word could have meant this in this culture. It could mean this in this culture. It, means that, it meant that then, but it means this now. They are now engaging in a battle of words to distract you off of the teaching of the text, which is how false teaching permeates the church. It's devastating for us to allow this to happen. A word battle pits the divine doctrine of God against the philosophy of man and leaves its listeners confused. It's a very successful route. Have you ever, have you ever stopped and wondered how we got to where we are? Just looking around our culture and how accepting and how worldly the church has become. You ever wondered how we got to where we are? A little bit at a time. Just a little bit at a time. If we can, if we can change the meaning of this word, if we can change the meaning of this teaching, if we can uh, argue about the semantics here and get them to believe this, one minor step at a time is now reaping the results of the church culture that we have in our land today. You could remove the Bible from a lot of our churches today and nothing would change from the teachings. It's devastating. We're asking questions. We're curious about things that aren't even in the Bible. We're spending time with our minds captivated and intrigued by teachings that have no biblical foundation whatsoever. I told the 830 service, I want to tell you this too, something you can listen for in sermons when you're... Uh, Hopefully you'll never hear it said here. 
uh, but when you're watching them on television or listening to them on the radio or visiting other churches, if you ever hear somebody take a text and say, I want to point something out that's never been pointed out before in this text, go ahead and turn your ears off because what is about to be said is the philosophy of man. It is not the doctrine of Scripture. Do you think that the powerful Word of God can be around for thousands of years and no one else has ever seen that in the text? It's probably because it's not there. All right? There's a phrase that, that uh, false teachers like to use. They say, we got to think outside of the box. Well, the problem is God drew the box. And the box is the Bible. And we don't need to think outside the Bible. We need to keep our thoughts captive to the truth of God's word and not compromise on that. So Paul says that the people who engage in these word wars, it will be to the ruin of the hearers. That's what Pastor Nathan was speaking of with the children this morning. It will be to the ruin of the hearers. Now let me, let me tell you what he actually said here. The word ruin is the word total devastation or eternal condemnation. The reason I know that is because the other place where this same word was used is 2 Peter 2.6 that says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and here's the word, condemned them to destruction. Ruin. Making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah would also happen to those who stray from the truth of God's word. But the opposite of what he says in verse 14 comes up in verse 15. The opposite of these word wars is lives converted by the unchanged power of the gospel. The truth of God's word, the absolute truth of God's word. And so what I want you to hear as we read verse 15, hear Paul saying, Timothy, you have got to fortify the walls of the church by getting your people into the word. Now before we read verse 15, let me just tell you how we do that here at New Providence. All the opportunities that we present to get our people into the Word, and then we can't make you take advantage of those opportunities, uh, but would, would strongly desire for you to. Uh, we have expositional, verse-by-verse -verse study of the Word that happens twice on Sunday mornings, 8.30 and 11, and what we're doing right now. We have Sunday school classes that are structured off of walking through one book at a time in, in the Scriptures uh, that are age-specific, life-specific, would love for you to participate in that. Then we have connect groups on Sunday nights, celebrate recovery on Sunday nights, that also uh, get people in small groups that discuss the Scriptures and grow together, holding one another accountable. Then we have an expositional teaching of the Word on Tuesday mornings for men, every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m., then we have what's starting this Wednesday, again, is an expositional walk-through study of the Word, the book of James, on uh, Wednesday nights that we'd love for you to be a part of. So this is all built around the basis that Paul says, Timothy, you want to fortify your walls against false teaching? Get your people in the Word. But just doing what we offer here is not enough. We've got to be in the Word daily in order to fortify our hearts and our minds against false teaching. Because it's everywhere. You turn on the radio. I, I turned on the radio last Sunday on the way to church. I didn't do it this Sunday because I didn't need the distraction. And I, I threw like four or five penalty flags on the sermon I heard just in the time it takes to get from my house to here. I even uh, emailed the radio station to find who it was that was preaching so I'd be sure never to listen to them again. But we have to fortify our minds and our hearts about what we're allowing in. What are you feeding upon? What, and, and unknowingly being led astray by these, uh, this war on words that's happening all around us. So let's read verse 15. Timothy, get them in the word. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Essentially, what we have in this verse is four steps that you can take to keep from being ashamed of how you handle God's Word. The word ashamed is a painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt or shortcoming. It's a painful feeling arising from the consciousness of having done something dishonorable. Well, what is that something? Mishandling God's truth. How do you keep from being ashamed in that area? 
Philippians 3 spells this out, verses 18 and 19. It says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. How do you prevent from being one of those people? And he gives us four steps. Step number one, very first part of the verse, be diligent. Be diligent in your study of the word. The word diligent means give maximum effort. Make a commitment to excellence. And think about verse two, it says, learn so that you can teach. The teacher must be a student. You must go to the word and and diligently study the word so that you can deliver the word accurately. And James tells us, When you teach the word, you're doubly accountable. You're accountable for what you believed and then what you encourage somebody else to believe. So dig into the word, be diligent, and strive for excellence as you study it. Every teacher has to be a student. Step two, present yourself approved to God. This word present means to come alongside. Uh, Billy Graham used to say, find out what God's doing and join him. Work, work with him, alongside of him, not against him, not in opposition. But then it says, so present, come alongside, present yourself. He uses this language in Romans 12, present yourself, your bodies as a living sacrifice. But if you look at it, present yourself approved, the word approved is the word proven through testing. So you go through trials, you come alongside God, you work diligently, And you prove the genuineness of your faith through trials as you serve the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And then Romans 12, listen to how similar the language is here. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies... Come alongside, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, or approved. Same language, approved, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Present yourself acceptable to God. Step number three, be a worker. This word worker can be translated laborer, the reference in mind here is a day laborer who works hard to accomplish the task, working hard toward a goal. And let me just ask you for a moment. Can that word be used to describe your time in the Scriptures? Can someone assess your quiet time daily and say, man, he's a, he's a worker. He's a laborer. I mean, he gets in there and, and really wrestles with that text to draw out every bit of application that it has. He's working at it. And then step four, of course, it all boils down to how we handle the word. So I want to I take a moment here. Paul says, rightly divide the word. Let me tell you something I do not pretend to be. I do not pretend to be good at construction. That was not my calling. I am thankful that it is some people's calling. Let me tell you what I struggle with. I struggle with making straight cuts. Anybody testify? All right, so you put two pieces together that I've cut, there's going to be a lot of gaps. They're not going to go together snugly. Why is it important to make a straight cut? So that the edges of the piece that you have will fit closely with the edges of the next piece. Guess what the phrase rightly divide means? Cut straight. How could we apply that to our study of Scripture? That means that no matter what verse, no matter what passage I've locked in on or I'm using to share with someone else or I'm even reading for myself, no matter what passage it is, I need to make sure I cut straight on both sides of that passage in such a way that it fits with all the other passages. You follow me? Rightly divide the word of truth Here's something I can encourage you with when you're studying Scripture. You need to lock this into your mind and do not compromise on it. No single verse of Scripture will ever contradict any other verse of Scripture. Do you believe that? 
No single verse of Scripture will ever contradict any other verse of Scripture. There are no crooked cuts. So make sure in your handling of that verse that you're cutting straight so that the sides fit with all the verses around it and the other passages that speak of it. Uh, Something that, that you can guarantee to be true every single time. If you find a possible contradiction you can guarantee that you are misinterpreting at least one of them every time. That needs to be your first assumption. Not, have I just discovered that the Bible contradicts itself? That's the beginning of the war on words that false teachers run with, is to get us to think that one says something different from what it says. So we want to make sure that we cut straight. We want to make sure that we rightly divide the text. Uh, There's a form of preaching that I like to call lifty-nifty preaching. There are guys that will lift a single verse or a single truth out of a text and they'll build a little nifty sermon around it, never returning back to the passage that it came from. And the way they used it in their sermon may not even mean what it was meant to mean because they lifted it out of the sermon. They did not cut their edges straight to make it congruent or fit snugly with the the text that were on either side of it. Another great truth that I could tell you that will help you in your study of Scripture is context is your friend when you're trying to understand a passage. You ever read a verse and have no idea what it meant? Read the verse right before it and the verse right after it. That'll help you. It'll help you understand what was being said because it was spoken as a whole, not as individual verses. We added the verses in our modern translations. So you don't have to stop there. So we rightly divide. We're to be diligent. We're to present ourselves to God. We're to be a worker and a laborer in our study of the Word. And we're to make sure we're rightly dividing the passages that we're studying. Scripture is congruent, is infallible, inerrant, timeless. There are no contradictions. So whether you're teaching a passage or studying a passage, make sure your cuts are straight. Then what happens in the passage, and we're moving along, we'll be at the end in just a moment. It says in verses 16 through 18, uh, he reverts back to what he told them to charge them with in verse 14. Read these verses with me right quick. It says, shun profane and idle babblings. That's those word wars. Idle babblings actually means empty chatter. uh, Conversations that mean nothing in your Christian walk. Shun those, uh, avoid those. For they will increase to more ungodliness. Wrong belief drives wrong behavior. False teaching drives false living. We have to hold on to that uh, and, and shun those things. And their message will spread like cancer. What do you do with cancer? You attack it with everything you have to get rid of it, right? Because it is never content with how much of you it consumes. That's what false teaching does. Who have straight, uh, And then he says it spreads like cancer... Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. Now think with me for a moment. If Paul were writing this letter to New Providence, and we're sitting here and he's telling us to be guarded against false teaching, and then he uses you as an example. Because Hymenaeus and Philetus were members of the church at Ephesus. They're like, I'm not so sure it's a good thing that my name just came up in this letter as Timothy's reading it aloud to the congregation. Their message will spread like cancer. Hermeneus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the, the truth. Saying that the, re, the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. Now what he did here, there's not further uh, expounding upon what verse 18 means. He takes a particular teaching that has led some people astray at Ephesus and he uses it as an illustration. Let me tell you what this teaching could have meant. The resurrection has already passed. I want you to see if if Paul's charge is appropriate for today to shun such teachings. If if, if I can convince you that the resurrection that you are going to experience has already passed, then I can also convince you that the best life you have to live is now. Think about it. Do those teachings exist today? Yes, they do. We have to shun such teachings and we have to safeguard against them and fortify the walls against such false teaching. The resurrection, our resurrection is yet to come. 
in Christ when he returns. So the best is not here now. The best is yet to come, and that's the hope that we have. So let's look at the last verse, verse 19. Verse 19 has a transitional word in it, the word nevertheless. And in the word nevertheless, we have, although it is true what I just said to you, nevertheless, this is also true. So even though false teaching has crept in among you and you need to fortify the walls, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. The solid foundation of God stands having this seal. What is the solid foundation? Use context. The solid foundation is the church, the people he's supposed to remind. But also right after that, the Lord knows those who are his. Well, who are his? Those who are part of his church. So the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we having a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We are a church without walls, a building not made with hands that belongs to God. And we will stand. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The foundation of God stands. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The foundation of God stands. You believe that, church? No matter what happens, no matter how many false teachings arise and creep into the churches around our land, the solid foundation of the church, the redeemed of God, will stand, will endure to the end. Romans 8, uh, the end of the chapter says, uh, no matter what happens to you, nothing can separate you from the love of God because you are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Because the solid foundation of God stands. Well, what's the true mark of this solid foundation? He tells us in verse 19, there is a seal that has been put on you to mark you as one of his. There's two assurances that come from that seal. Number one is whose you are. And number two, who you are. Who have you you been saved to be? So we've got redemption and then we have sanctification. We have our salvation rooted in God where he says... In verse 19, the Lord knows those who are His. Here's a, here's a truth that you can hold on to. John 10, 28 through 30. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Does that encourage you? Nothing can snatch me out of His hand. I am His. It's kind of like on a cornerstone for a commercial building. The the contractor will often put his mark on the cornerstone when it is set as a uh, kind of a signature. Well, God has done that to us. He has put his signature, and our cornerstone is Christ, and we are his, and he knows who we are. Our faith is, is rooted in him and safe with him. But how about the carrying out of that faith? Because that's the second mark of the seal, Your own sanctification. And I want to end here where he says the second part of the seal is let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You want to know what the biggest problem in our culture today is? Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The biggest part of our, the biggest problem in our culture today is not how prevalent sins are becoming. It's how accepting the church is becoming of those sins. That's the greatest devastation of our culture today. It's not that sins are getting more pronounced and prevalent and popular and gaining popularity. It's that the church is becoming accepting of such things. So let me just ask you a question. And this is where we're going to wind up. If the church becomes accepting of the sins of its culture, the church will begin to look like its culture, right? That's just a logical flow. If the church looks just like the culture, what does the church have to offer the culture? Answer it. Nothing. Nothing. 
if we're no different than the culture that we've been placed in, we have nothing of benefit to offer. But if we are set apart, what does the seal say? Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let them turn from sin and turn toward God. What's that called? Repentance. John the Baptist said there's no salvation apart from repentance. If we're no different than the culture is, we're of no good to the culture. So the greatest way we can love them is to show them those differences and point them to Christ. We're not different because we're better. We're different because we're surrendered to Christ and it's in Him that we find our strength to honor and glorify Him. So know what you believe in. Know who you belong to and be equipped to stand up for it. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to close by highlighting a group of people that don't get talked about much in the Bible because there's only two verses that speak of them. It's a group of people known as the Bereans. And I would be overly delighted to pastor a flock of Bereans. Berea is a suburb of Thessalonica. Paul went to Thessalonica in Acts 17 and was preaching the gospel there. People were getting saved, lives were being changed, church was being planted, uh, just advancing like wildfire. The Judaizers come in and try to arrest Paul. Christians help Paul sneak out of Thessalonica without getting caught. And he winds up in this little town called Berea. He preaches the same message to them. Now let me, let me ask you for a moment. If Paul, the Apostle Paul, were resurrected, and I was able to get on his speaking calendar to have him come to New Providence and preach a sermon, how many of you would take the words from his mouth as gospel truth? I would. It's the Apostle Paul, second only to Jesus, greatest missionary ever walked the face of the earth, aside from Jesus Christ himself. Paul goes to Berea, starts preaching the same message as he preached in Thessalonica, not a single person believed him. It says that they were more fair-minded than that. They went home. They tested everything they heard Paul say with Scripture. When they found out that what Paul had said was congruent with Scripture, they came back the next day and they rejoiced with what he had preached was truth. <laughs> yeah, amen. Praise God. So... We need to be like the Bereans, right? There, I'm going to venture to say that there are some of you, I've been the pastor here going on 12 years, I have built a trust with you. Especially those of you who have been here for a majority of those 12 years. I, I haven't led you astray yet. When I have, I've gotten up the next Sunday and apologized. Okay? I, I try to do my homework and, and root all of my teaching in the Word of God. You still should not take that as the gospel truth. I am not Jesus. I have the potential to lead you astray. How do you fortify the walls of your heart? You don't believe it as gospel truth until you've had the opportunity to test it with the word of God. Then you believe it. We need to be doing that no matter who we're listening to. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22 says, Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Let's fortify the walls. We need to fortify the walls of this church, not allowing false teaching to creep in. You need to fortify the walls of your heart, not allowing false teaching to creep in. The only way we can do that is by getting into the Word. So I'm going to close the sermon in prayer. I want to invite Ian and Ostel to come back up and lead us in a closing song. Let's bow our heads together. Father, thank you for your timeless truth. we would be lost without it. You have given us instruction. God breathed instruction that is profitable for rebuke, for instruction, for righteousness, for building others up, from discerning right from wrong. And so many people are straying from that instruction. May we be known as a congregation of believers who, who cut straight, who rightly divide the word of truth in our handling of it, so that it fits neatly and perfectly with all other truths spelt out in your word that are to be applied to our lives. But Lord, I, I want to branch even a little further than that and say may our application 
of those truths have straight cuts as well. That our lives would reflect the Word of God indwelling in us, the person of Jesus Christ. My prayer today for the parishioners, the, the souls that are in this room, whether they are a member of New Providence or not, my prayer today for them is that you would not allow them to be content with how much time they currently spend in your word. My prayer today is that you would increase their conviction to get into your word more. As a worker, as a laborer, diligent, presenting ourselves acceptable to you, rightly dividing the word of truth, so that we live a life that needs not be ashamed. We know that that is the only way we can fortify these walls against false teaching, fortify our hearts against distraction, fortify our lives against false living, is to get into your word. So Lord, drive us deeper into spending time with you on a daily basis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.